Welcome everybody. We're just going to let the room fill up a bit before we begin. Just waiting a few minutes. Just letting the room fill up. I think we can get started. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the, tonight's event. My name is Christine Schmidt, and I'm the Deputy Director and Head of Research at the Wiener Holocaust Library. Thank you all for joining us this evening from wherever you're logging in from. Uh, please feel free to let us know in the chat. Um, I'm delighted to be hosting this in conversation with Dr. Rebecca Clifford, led by Professor Dan Stone, to launch Dr. Clifford's new remarkable book, Survivors, Children's Lives After the Holocaust. The premise of this book is based on a pretty powerful question. How can we make sense of our lives when we don't know where we come from? This question was particularly pressing for the youngest survivors of the Holocaust who had vague or non-existent memories from before the war. And I think what is particularly noteworthy about this book is that Dr. Clifford tries to recover this period of post-war history from the perspective of children themselves, which is no simple task, and I think she has succeeded. I've been following Rebecca's project for several years now as our paths have crossed at several conferences and during her research at the library in London. And it's wonderful to see this research come to fruition in such a beautifully written, accessible account. In many ways, Dr. Clifford's book challenges our assumptions about trauma, childhood, and children's agency. And I'm very much looking forward to tonight's conversation, which will undoubtedly delve into these issues further. So just a few notes of housekeeping before I introduce our speakers and hand over to Dan Stone. Please feel free to enter your questions in the chat at any time. I see a lot of if you've already checking in where you're from. And we'll save some time at the end of the formal remarks to um, get to as many of your questions as possible. We're also trying to live stream this on YouTube. And if you are uh, tuning in from YouTube, um, please do send us comments or questions from there. And my colleague Martina will send those over to me. And finally, I'm also pleased to note that our neighbors in London, the London Review Bookshop, have offered a 10% discount on Rebecca's book tonight. And I'll drop the link uh, to be able to purchase that book in the chat shortly. 
So on to our speakers. Our chair tonight is Professor Dan Stone, who is Professor of Modern History and Director of the Holocaust Research Institute at Royal Holloway University of London. He's a historian of ideas who works primarily on 20th century European history. His research interests include the history and interpretation of the Holocaust, comparative genocide, history of anthropology, history of fascism, the cultural history of the British right, and theory of history. Just a few things. He is the author or editor of 16 books and over 80 scholarly articles. And our author tonight, Dr. Rebecca Clifford, is Associate Professor of Modern European History at Swansea University and author of Commemorating the Holocaust, The Dilemmas of Remembrance in France and Italy. Her chief research interests are 20th century European history, oral history, Holocaust history, and memory studies. Her new book, Survivors, has been nominated for a number of leading prizes in the field, including the Wingate Prize, the Wolfson History Prize, and the Bailey Gifford Prize for nonfiction. Over to you, Dan. Thank you, Christine. Um, can I start, first of all, by uh, congratulating you, Rebecca, on uh, the publication of this book? I'd like to reiterate what Christine said. I mean, first of all, it's, it's a, an ambitious and hugely challenging project. Secondly, it's beautifully written um, and it's accessible, but that does not mean that it sacrifices in any way scholarly rigor or difficult questions. And it's, it's a critically uh, and analytically challenging book, uh, but it's, it raises those questions in a wholly accessible form. And that's not something that one can very often say, I think, about a scholarly text. Uh, so it's really, it, it was a, a, a wonderful book to read and I uh, recommend it to everybody who's uh, attending this evening. It's, it's full of extraordinary stories, some of them incredibly powerful about the, the people, that, the children, and then later as adults uh, that you talk about. And it's also full of some quite subversive statements and uh, analyses, as Christine said, concerning the nature of trauma, uh, concerning childhood, and particularly, we'll, we'll come on to this in, in a bit, I think, concerning how people make sense of their lives. So for example, just one of, the, one of the wonderful sentences in this book, at one point you say, there is little catharsis to be had in revealing a broken life narrative. A simple statement, but one which pushes at everything that we often would like to think about holo how Holocaust survivors have made sense of their lives. And I think one of the things that you do in the book so successfully is to force us to think about the, the success or otherwise um, of how people, survivors have, have actually coped in, in their own lives. And you do so in, in I think, an incredibly sensitive and, uh, and powerful fashion. So there are lots of questions um, that I've got and I'm sure that everybody else has got as well. So uh, we, should, we should crack on. So I, I thought first, um, and particularly in light of, of Christine's introduction, it might be useful for you to say something, first of all, about um, how historians let's say since uh, Deborah Dwork's book, Children with a Star, how historians have written about children, um, how you see the main uh, trends in, in the field uh, developing, and what sources there are to write about children, particularly to write about children from their own perspective. Uh, thank you so much, Dan. Uh, before I start talking about children and how historians write about children, I just want to say thanks to Dan, thanks to Christine, thank you to the Vayner Library for hosting this, and thank you to everyone who has come because I'm, I'm looking at your comments in the chat, I'm looking at the participant list, and I'm seeing people who are really very precious to me from all over the world have tuned in. And there's of course it's a bit disappointing to have to meet you all on zoom when i really want to be standing around in the wiener library holding a glass of wine and you know getting to talk to all of you but the truth is there's many of you here tonight who couldn't make it to london because you're in canada or uh israel or in the united states so there are some ways in which this i mean we're lucky to be able to do this too and it's it's just so lovely to to know that you're here even though i can't see you so um, this question, if I step out actually a bit from thinking about how historians have written about children in the war, Jewish children in the war, child survivors, and just think about how historians have written about children more broadly. Um, I know that this is a mixed audience in the sense you're not all historians, so I, I don't want to I don't want to talk too much about historiography, but I think I can say that historians have not always uh, written about children. Um, and 
there has for a long time been a kind of current in history, which you might call the history of childhood. It is not the same thing as the history of children. It looks at cultural concepts of childhood. And so, uh, you know, if you looked at um, work in that field, you'd find things like kind of analyses of children's literature or education. So it's sort of more about how adults think about children and how they treat children and how children are seen as different sorts of beings as we go through history. And that's very interesting, but that is not what I've tried to do here. I think much, much more recently, there has been a, a trend of, of well, what you could call the history of children, which genuinely tries to look at children as historical actors and agents in their own right with a limited agency because children are limited in their in their power um, but with you know as human beings with free will who do things that have consequences and so my work definitely slots into that that trend of trying to think about children as not as objects but as subjects um, and here I think I've been very much informed by watching my own children grow and seeing just how far they do have wills of their own and desires of their own and they know how to manifest those. And um, so that's my starting point. Um, and I'm certainly not the only historian working in that way. So I try to see children as, as agents in their own right. I think since um, Deborah Dork's work, there's been just some incredible work on child survivors and children in the war, both both uh, Jewish and non-Jewish children in the war. Um, and in fact, looking over the list of participants tonight, some of the leading scholars in that field are here. And I, I say hello to all of you. You are all dear friends and I'm so happy to see you. I mean, there's just been some incredible recent work. Uh, for example, I, I thought, gosh, if I start to say names, I'm gonna forget somebody who's really influenced me, but Boaz Cohen is here tonight and his work on very early um, testimony of child survivors is just absolutely groundbreaking. Um, Antoine Burgard is here tonight and his work on um, child survivors who go to Canada is, is just a, absolutely groundbreaking as well and so many friends and um and scholars who have tried to recapture the experiences of children who survived the holocaust however they will all know that it's really hard to do and that's because children don't leave a very big trace in the archives um and I think I, <laughs> I, I see that my very de dear colleague and my, indeed my PhD supervisor, Robert Gilday is here tonight. And Robert said to me at some point, I think I was talking about, you know, how hard it is to, to find children's voices in the archives. He said, yeah, but we have to try. And I think that idea that it's hard, but we have to try has really driven what I've done. So I know that there are very serious limitations, certainly in terms of sources, and, and we'll, we'll get to talking about that in a minute. Um, but we have to try. And we will always come up against limits, and we will always have questions that cannot be answered when we work on children. But we can try to recover their voices, and in some ways we can, we can succeed. Um, Dan, you asked about sources. Yeah. Shall I start, shall I launch into talking about sources? Absolutely, go ahead. Okay, and I've got some images to show you actually. So um, I tried to use as many different ways into the history of these children. And I should also add at this point that of course the book um, looks at children, but it looks at them through their entire post-war lives. So throughout much of the book, they're not actually children. The, the, there's 100 child survivors whose stories I look at for the book. And, you know, they're only children for a small portion of that. And it follows them right through to the present. So I, children, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Um, so I tried to think how I could recover the stories of these 100 children who become adults from as many angles as I possibly could. And not only that, but through as many decades as I possibly could. That was actually very challenging because there were decades that were kind of rich in archival holdings, especially the immediate post-war period. There were decades when I could actually find very little, especially the 1950s and 60s, it was hard to uncover things. I can, I can talk a bit about that in a minute. So I used uh, documents like um, reports from care homes for those children who ended up after the war living in a care home, um, case, uh, case reports that were drawn up by aid workers, 
Um, I used letters, I used photographs, I used things like psychiatric reports where those were available. I mean, obviously there's some very um, big issues, of kind of ethical issues um, using some of this material and, and maybe we can talk about that in the, in the question and answer at the end. Um, and then I, it was so hard to fill that gap in between sort of 19, like 45 to 50 and now. And so when I started to think, okay, well, what kind of archival resources could shed light on those years? There were a few different things. Um, and the main uh, thing I looked at was actually um, indemnity claims uh, from the late 1950s, early 1960s. So, um, you know, reparations claims that often had a lot of powerful material in them. Then getting on towards the kind of 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, the main resource I used at that point was uh, oral history. And I also conducted interviews myself, um, but I combined that with these historical oral history resources that, as I say, some of them, the earliest ones uh, date from the late 70s, and then that kind of grow, they grow in number through the 1980s and the 1990s. All of this is to say that what I really wanted to do in a kind of perfect scenario was take an individual and find a way to chart their life through documents you know, over a 75 year period. Now, not every one of the 100, I didn't manage that for every one of the 100 children in the book, but there were a few individuals that really, they had done, for example, multiple oral histories, they had left uh, collections of documents to the archives, and I was able to piece together their life as kind of stretching through, through time like this. And I mean, that was fabulous because that allowed me to see how their relationship with their own past changed over time. The thing I want to show you, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, hold on a second. Oops. Oh dear. I have to go back to the beginning. Bear with me. Can everybody, can you see this all right? Yeah. Okay. I wanted to show you what types of documents children do leave in the archives because if you think about what ends up in an archive and i have a lot of so i see some dear archivist friends who are here tonight and they'll really understand this issue archives are limited in what they can hold they hold things that seem to have value and we don't often value what children create in fact i've got this kind of fantasy that one day i'd love to like oversee the creation of an archive solely of children's documents because it's expensive to keep documents. Why would you keep something that seems to have no, no value? However, having said that, if you dig around enough, you will find documents created by children. Here's an example. Um, a letter uh, written by a girl. I think that it doesn't have the year on it, but it's 1951. Um, so this is a child survivor who's with her sister in an orphanage in France, she's lost her parents and her entire extended family. And the reason I'm, I do quote from this uh, letter in the book, um, the reason I'm showing it to you is because I think when you do find children's documents in, in the archives, you have to take what they write with a grain of, of salt because children are often told what to write in their letters. You know, you remember as a child being told to write a thank you note or something, you know, it's, it doesn't necessarily express what's in their kind of deepest heart, I suppose. And, um, for those of you who can read French, you've probably already read this letter. So you'll notice it that the girl says, well, you know, we were happy to get, oh, so she's writing to the woman who uh, rescued her and housed her and kept her safe during the war. And this woman was very, very dear to her, uh, like a mother to her. And at the war's end, she was it removed from the care of this woman and placed in an orphanage, uh, which was also a very lovely place that she, she felt very comfortable in. So she talks a little bit, she's writing to this woman who rescued her and she says, oh, you know, uh, we, thanks for your letter. And then she says things like, it's cold here. How is it where you are? The director of the, of the care home put on some films for us to see and we went to the swimming pool. But in the middle of the letter, it just it drops this bomb, basically. It says, we won't be able to come and see you this year because um, we're going to America on the 23rd of, of January on the Washington, on, the, on, the, on the, the Washington boat. And I thought about this a lot. So I think either it shows how little the child understood about what was about to happen to her, 
or how she was trying to conceal her own fears about what was happening to her. Because of course, what was happening to her is she was being sort of sent into immigration and she would never come back to France again. And I think this question, sort of this letter and letters like this leave us with a lot of questions we can't answer, but they're very interesting questions to, to consider. I mean, this was a pivotal and decisive moment in this child's life that changed everything about her future. How far she understood that is a question. How much she was afraid is a question. Did she realize she would never see this beloved woman again until she was an adult? It's all there to, to consider. Um, I will show you also this. Here's another sort of sort of thing that you might find in, in the archives. So there are a small number of paintings and drawings by children, by child survivors that you will find uh, in the archives. Oh, I should add that both of those documents are from the United States Holocaust uh, Memorial Museum in DC. So here's a, a picture, uh, a painting uh, painted by a girl who was a survivor of Auschwitz. Um, obviously a very happy family scene for a girl who, um, I mean, it looks like there's a girl and her little brother and her mother. And I think they're preparing the table for a uh, Sukkot. I can't remember now, I've written this in the book, but um, you know, there's a scene, a family scene. Of course, the girl did not, did not have a family. She was also living in an orphanage. And so how might we read these sorts of documents? I mean, did she, was she expressing some desire from her heart or was she simply just told to paint a happy scene and this is what a happy scene seemed to look like to her? How far is it, you know, how far is their adult kind of mediation when children create um, paintings like this? They're all questions we can ask, I suppose, about documents. So um, I'll stop the share, but just to give you a sense of, of what sorts of documents they, there are out there and also the, the trouble of in, in dealing with children's documents, I suppose. Yes, thanks, Rebecca. It's extremely informative. Can I can I come back to the point about testimony and post-war testimonies? Because you you talk about the fact that um, most of the ones that you use stem from the late seventies onwards. But one of the things that you note is that, uh, as as you say, because you're trained as an oral historian, you you recognise the fact that the word testimony and and the giving of testimony connotes a legal context which tends to imply a kind of coherence and uh, factual accuracy, which child survivors simply often could not provide in terms of their own backgrounds. Um, and again, this, you know, this is one of the challenging things that you, you say in the book. So if I can just cite one passage, you say, child survivors unsure of the veracity of their memories and often unable to put remembered events into a logical order struggled to get their stories to conform to the testimonial frame. If testimony is, as the historian and psychoanalyst Henry Greenspan argues, simply one genre of survivors retelling, it was one that was fundamentally ill-suited to the stories of child survivors. So could you say a bit more about the, if you like, the, uh, the dichotomy between oral history on the one hand and testimony on the other? Absolutely. And of course, I have a natural bias because I think of myself as an oral historian. I've been trained by some amazing oral historians. And when I, when I, when I picked up on this, I suppose I, it went, it harkened back to a kind of niggling worry I've had about the word testimony for a very long time. Because I, um, my, quite a long time before I started this project, I started to notice when I was at Holocaust conferences versus oral history conferences, that the two groups don't tend to talk to each other very well. And that's not good for either side, really. It means that oral historians have missed out on some of the kind of remarkable discoveries of Holocaust historians. And Holocaust historians have also often missed out on some of the really important theoretical points raised by oral historians. Um, and so this concept of, of testimony, well, of course it comes, I mean, I, I talk about this quite a bit in the book and I don't wanna go too far into it today, but it comes out of a legal context, obviously. And I fully understand that there's very good reasons why Holocaust scholars chose to adopt that term early on. And it was partly to, refute the idea that the stories of Holocaust survivors didn't have value. 
So it was a way at a certain moment in time to give them value to say these are valuable documents in a legal context and in a pedagogical context. The problem with that is then, of course, that it does put a certain stress on the person speaking to try to at least adhere in some ways to a, a logical narrative, a coherent narrative, narrative, and a factually accurate narrative. And actually, this is something I talked about a lot with um, a number of the survivors I interviewed myself, because they are really a very understandably worried um, about giving factually accurate narratives. They want to give them and they're furious that they can't in some cases. But I, what I wanted to do when we got to this point was tell you a bit, I'm just gonna, I don't know if this is um, sort of disruptive to keep sharing the screen. I'm just gonna briefly show you um, a picture of Zenka. So, oh, sorry. I don't know if everybody can see this picture right in the middle there's a little girl with a big smile on her face, and that is Zenka. Um, I know Zenka very well, and we've worked together a, a lot on this project. And um, uh, Zenka's story, I, I wanted to read you a little bit from the book. So Zenka was, um, well, a second. Let, me, let me not tell you the wrong things about Zenka. She was born in Prague in 1939. She was deported to Theresian Stadt as a toddler with her mother but she has no memory of her mother. She was a toddler at the time. She was interviewed in 1997 um, for a really big oral history testimony project uh, that was founded by Steven Spielberg for anybody who doesn't know. So it's called Survivors of the Shoah, a visual history archive. So she was interviewed. Now, the, one of the things about this particular project was that they were very strict about um, the linear narrative of the story. So they wanted survivors, if I'm not mistaken, to tell a kind of 20% about the post, the, sorry, the pre-war period of their lives, and then so 60% on the war, so like, listen, then a little bit on the post-war period, so that it followed a kind of narrative arc, and they all followed the same narrative arc, I suppose. But that was really hard, if not impossible, for child survivors. So in 1997, when Zenka was interviewed for this project, I'll just read a little bit from the book to you. The interviewer said, as she was, supposed, as she was meant to say, what was your mother's name? And Zenka said, well, I can give you her name, but I can't tell you anything about her because I don't remember. I haven't got any recollections of her. At this particular point, Zenka had never even seen a picture of either of her parents. I mean, she knew their names and that was really it. Then in later years, she would actually learn quite a bit more about them, but she wasn't, she wasn't there yet, even though it was 1997. But the interviewer just kept asking. So again, the interviewer said, do you remember anything about your mother? And Zenka said, I've already said no. <laughs> Finally, the interviewer asked again and Zenka just, exploded and she said look when the matron of my care home asked me about my mother i couldn't say anything to her i don't have any memories my earliest memories are in the camp later on she recalled in another interview not actually the interview she did with me but an interview she did in 2007 her fury at this experience she said the interviewer asked me what toys there were in Teretzin and what smells can you remember and what Jewish holidays, but how could there be Jewish holidays in a camp and toys? We were told that anyone interviewing grown-ups who were children had had special training. But how can you ask those sorts of questions? I mean, I was three and a half when I was in the camp. How can I remember that? And I just raised that example because I think it really highlights some of the emotions involved for child survivors when they found themselves, you know, so happy to finally be asked about their life stories and so terribly caught out by the fact that the testimony frame exposed all those holes and lacunas, made them so glaring that it became unbearable. Um, and so that is why I raised the question of, you know, maybe we, we, maybe we could use a different term to talk about this because testimony hasn't fit very well with what child, child survivors, you know, with their experience. I have to admit, of course, my own preference is, is simply to say oral history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, you make the case very powerfully. So um, I think that's, that's really, really helpful. 
I guess the thing, the thing to add is that, um, to paraphrase a great, great oral historian, Alessandro Portelli, he says, you know, oral history isn't about what happened in the past. Mm -hmm. It's about what people believe happened in the past and what they fear happened and what they wish had happened. And so it's a, um, a nice vessel in which to, to contain stories that have a lot of absences and, mm -hmm. and holes and silences because, um, there's room to talk about what those mean in the present when we use terms like oral history. Yeah, and Portelli also says, doesn't he, that there's no such thing as a, as a false Absolutely. oral oral history interview, precisely for the reasons that you've said. That perhaps leads us on to the question then of um, something, that you've, well, something you've already referred to, which is the agency of children, um, because how they remember acting in the past when they talk about it later on is very revealing in in that respect what you what you show in the book i mean some really remarkable stories is uh, you, you know examples of children lying about their past very deliberately in the immediate post-war period children colluding with adults uh, in order to get uh, what they wanted so immigration for example so uh, for orphan schemes uh, when children and their parents would lie about the fact that they were orphans in order to then be reunited later in Canada or the US or, or wherever. Or, as you put it, children cre pre presenting creatively reimagined pasts. It's a really um, nice phrase, I, I think, in order to, to get what they want. I wonder to, to what extent the, that the ability that those children that you look at to do that was a reflection of their wartime experiences. Either they'd had to learn to lie in order to survive in the first place. And for them, this was just you know, we think about the end of the war and then su survival as a different phase in life. But maybe for those children, it was just a continuation of a similar kind of process. I thought about that a lot because, of course, so many of these children, especially children who survived the war in hiding, they've often had false identities or totally made up backgrounds. They might be so young that they once they start, you know, telling the lie of the false identity, they can't even remember the, you know, the truth of where they're really from or who their parents really are. And I guess the thing I, I loved to think about was then how far that actually simply becomes part of the life story as time goes on. And so I wanted to tell you the story, one of the stories that's in the book. I don't have a, a picture for this a particular child, but um, I tell the story of Aaron B. So He's um, born in uh, Bialystok in 1935, and he is one of the children who comes to Canada on a scheme run by the Canadian uh, Jewish Congress. And a uh, shout out to the archivist, uh, Janice Rosen, who's here tonight. Hi, Janice. Um, because she enabled all of this research and also asked me some great questions that made me really think about these things. So he, uh, he ends up after the war in a DP camp. And that's where he's interviewed by the Canadian Jewish Congress officers in 1947. So he tells his story. He tells them that his parents were deported. I am just looking at my notes because with 100 kids in the book, I just don't, sometimes I start mixing up the stories. Um, he, he says his parents have been deported or deported to Estonia and they were killed in a camp in 1943. And he says that his maternal aunt is in a nearby uh, DP camp and she's applying to um, to immigrate to Canada on a scheme, for, a special uh, scheme that there was in Canada for tailors. So um, he says his maternal aunt, no one seems to question why the maternal aunt seems to have the father's last name, but I mean, no, 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 no one notices maybe there's something a little fishy going on in this case. So he emigrates to Canada on the scheme. He arrives in 1948. His aunt arrives a couple of months later. Um, the agency doesn't seem to notice that anything is a little strange at first but by the time his file closes in 1950 they have started to refer to her as the aunt in quotation marks so they may be picking up on the fact that the aunt is actually his mother because of course to emigrate on the canadian scheme which was also true for the british scheme and the australian scheme and the south african scheme and many other schemes for orphan uh, child survivors you had to be an orphan so the only way for him to, to get to Canada was by pretending he was an orphan. 
I think, um, as I write in the book, I think we can all of us be very sympathetic about the need for this deception. And wouldn't we all do it if that was the only way out of an absolutely dead end life in a DP camp in Europe? I mean, I think we can all understand. The interesting, interesting thing about Aaron's case, however, is that I have never met him in, in person, but he um, gave an interview for, again, for the Shoah Foundation uh, Visual History Archive project in 1998. What I found interesting was how he talked about this deception. Keeping in mind that, uh, as Dan raised earlier, he had basically lived with this lie that his mother was his aunt for something like eight years. It was a very, very long period of his childhood where he had practiced this lie. So in his interview that he gives in 1998, he talks about his mother and he talks about how it had been possible to you know, for them to come to Canada because the Canadian Jewish Congress had decided it was okay to have half orphans. And actually, I admit, I listened to his interview early enough in my project that he kind of threw me for a loop there. Like, oh, really? No, the answer is no. The Canadian scheme never had half orphans. That's simply his, his way of explaining and, and justifying without fully acknowledging what was going on. I, I really thought a lot about, um, you know, how we, when we tell our life histories in an oral history interview. We need, we all of us feel a need to tidy up the ragged ends, right? He didn't want to bring shame on his mother. He didn't want to start talking. I mean, he perfectly could have said, well, we lied because we didn't have any choice. But it did make me wonder, and I can't answer, how far he might simply have have, you know, <laughs> glossed over the, the all those years of lying, how much they simply might be part of his life story in a way that nobody could ever tease out the strands. And his wasn't the only case where I thought, you know, how <laughs> sometimes the, the, the deception becomes deeply built into, into who I think, who these people are in some ways. Um, but that's a very, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, I feel funny even saying it in a way, because as I said before, many of the, the children, child survivors who I talked to, obviously now in their 70s and 80s, were adamant that they wanted to make sure they only said things that were true. And that is because they have literally had to fight tooth and nail sometimes to learn the truth. And so it's a, it's a slippery slope, but it's present certainly in the archives and it's present in the oral history as well. Yeah. Um and just to say to people watching that there are lots of examples like that in, yeah. in the book and some some really um, some, some extraordinary stories that you uh, talk about there. One of the things that I found subversive or, or challenging in the book, dis despite the example of, of Aaron that you gave just now, is is your claim. And I think this is you, you build this claim out of some uh, very careful historical analyses of the care homes after the war one of the things you show is that um, what we think of as family mm. is something that we need to historicize and something that we need to question what I think what you show quite convincingly in the book is that what children need is uh, a loving parental figure not necessarily a biological parent I wonder if you could say something a bit about that based on some of your cases I guess that there were I mean, one of the things I loved about writing this book was I was constantly surprised and shocked by things I discovered. Constantly things were throwing me for a loop. And this was one of the main ones, I suppose. And that's great. We, as historians, we love to be surprised and shocked because that's actually a shock to our own assumptions, isn't it? So if I found it shocking that I mean, we'll never know what percentage of child survivors had a surviving parent, but it's higher than you might think. And yet, so few of those children went back to live with their parents again, in many cases. If you find that shocking, <laughs> it's probably because you, like I, have some very deep-seated assumptions about the nature of family and the idea that you know, for a child to survive and for and to get back together with a parent again must necessarily be a happy ending. And that was not what I found. And, and that was hard to accept in many ways, um, especially when, as I, you know, as I say, I'm writing about this with my, watching my own children grow. But in fact, when I think about the 100 children in the book, 
the ones who described the happiest childhoods were actually the ones who ended up in care homes, not the ones who were returned to parents. And I think even though we might not like to accept that, it's not a huge push for us to think about the post-war Jewish family as a very, very fragile entity. And that is not just because parents had gone through their own horrific experiences that left them often deeply traumatized, but also that they, you know, returned to homes that where well, they didn't have a home. They didn't have their, you know, their home or apartment had been stolen and no one was giving it back. Their furniture had been looted. They had lost their partners. They had lost their jobs. They literally had no means. Um, the main um, aid organization in the French case, for example, the Ose, they were quite disturbed by how many of the children in their care actually had parents who were living in Paris, for example, but the parents were not in any state to take care of them. And often they simply thought to themselves, I'll put my child in a care home for a little while until I get back on my feet again. But the problem was, they had often been separated from their children already for years. They were quickly becoming strangers to each other a couple more years in the care home. And it was easy to say, oh, they seem happy in that care home. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna leave them there. And sure enough, there um, are quite a number of stories in the book about families that try to come back together again and it falls apart. So I thought I might tell you one of those stories. So again, I will show you a picture. Um, this is not this one. The, so the child at the top is Erwin. Um, Erwin died before I was able to interview him. So I've never met him uh, in person. Um, but I will tell you a, a bit about Erwin. He was born in 1937 in, in Slovakia. This, by the way, is from a, a 1948 um, newspaper article about child survivors in, in Britain. Uh, I'll let you have a look at it and then I'll stop the, stop the screen share. Um, he was born in 1937 in Slovakia, and he actually, I'm going to stop it now, he spent the war years uh, in hiding with his mother, which was, which was fairly rare. So he was actually never separated from his mother. But at the end of the war, she was too physically weak to even stand up. So um, he, she was brought back to her hometown sort of on a cart, like on a horse-drawn cart, and he was walking behind the cart, and his aunt, who had survived, happened to see him. So she took him in for a little while, but she couldn't cope with him either and so she put him in a in a care home and then time passed as it does and the mother was given an opportunity to try to go illegally to palestine but um she couldn't bring him so she thought okay well maybe he can come afterwards or well i don't really know what she thought um but we might assume that anyway um it's, it's something he he assumed um so she tried to enter palestine illegally she was caught by british troops and she was interned uh, on cyprus and Irwin was sent uh, nobody really understands why was sent to britain on a scheme to bring holocaust uh, child holocaust survivors to britain so he ends up in a in an orphanage in britain where he's actually quite happy when he's 12 years old his mother uh sort of summons him to live with her in israel so he's saying he's kind of torn out of this place where he's quite comfortable and he's sent to live with her in israel and when he arrives there's nobody there to meet him he ends up like living for months in a tent sort of in the sand um and then finally his mother shows up and says well actually i've remarried and we really can't fit you into the home and the um he ends up sort of going from one kibbutz to another and the kibbutz staff are always saying look you have to take your son back and she says well i really i really don't have the space for him he ends up spending the rest of his life in a kibbutz and he never lives with his mother again and the thing about erwin's story is is it's actually quite typical the fact that he was never separated from his mother is the is the unusual part of the story. The fact that he wasn't able to live with her again was really quite common. So I suppose that there's something, you know, I think for any of us that have families, there's something troubling about that. But the happy part, I suppose, is that children could be really very, um, very happy and feel very, very loved in care homes. Um, there's a chapter of the book about care homes, and I think some of the post-war care homes were genuinely extraordinary places where really radical pedagogical ideas were trialed, where children were given a lot of agency and their voices were taken very seriously, 
and many children describe you know very happy memories of those care homes so it's i suppose also wonderful to know that children can receive love and feel mm -hmm. valued by people who aren't their parents and that can be a, a really wonderful experience yeah and the, the care homes i think were also um places where a lot of assumptions working assumptions of uh, psychiatrists and psychoanalysts were unpicked as well christine do we have time for one more question for, on this yeah, sure. Go ahead. And then just to say, if, if um, anyone who's listening has questions, please feel free to start um, placing them in the chat. Okay, because I, I thought that um, one of the most brilliant chapters in the book is um, chapter seven on, on trauma, where you, you, you write about the history of psychoanalysis, but again, in a completely accessible way. And what's so shocking about uh, what you describe about the, the way in which the, the children's carers wrote about them or used them for their case studies and so on um, is the way in which they were eventually forced to rethink many of their assumptions particularly the assumption that children um, who suffered what we would today call trauma uh, did not necessarily suffer because of the war and its effects but because of the absence of a mother um, and particularly when you talk about the famous studies by uh, Anna Freud and, and uh, Burlingham and so on um, the the way in which Anna Freud herself was forced to rethink many of her assumptions in light of the German restitution law and, and what happened to, to child survivors in, in those cases, I think is really an extraordinary story. So I, I think it, it would be wonderful to hear you say a bit about that. It's such a long story. <laughs> and I'm well, aware that we do have a lot of a brief version. <laughs> I try to think how to give the brief version. I also just, I, I, I will add at this point that then I'm, I'm, if we ever get out of lockdown and my children go back to school, I will start writing the next book I am planning on writing, which is specifically about um, the interaction between Anna Freud and these child survivors throughout their lives and throughout her life, because I think there's a real, a really interesting story there to tell. Um, I am not a historian of of psychoanalysis in any way. And I think at times I've been kind of hard on mental health experts in the book. I um, to do that, anyway. Okay, well, th thank goodness, <laughs> uh, because actually my mother worked most of her, her career as a psychologist and I learned so much from her work as a psychologist and I in no way mean to devalue the work of psychologists, but I think the history of the interaction between mental health experts and child survivors is so fascinating. And so I do have a chapter about it in the book. And actually it's kind of, I talk about it throughout the book. Um, and I think the thing to keep in mind um, is, 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 is that concept of trauma, that idea we have that trauma describes a state of psychological pain is a very, very modern concept. We did not have any, I, you know, there was no diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder until the late 1970s. It only enters the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Psychiatry in 1980, right? And I had some fun just playing with the, um, the Oxford English Dictionary looking for terms like, you know, I understand the trauma you have suffered. No one uses a sentence like that before like the late 1970s. So this idea of trauma, Trauma as being something that has lasting consequences is very, very new. Now, the reason there's a kind of um, coming together, I suppose, of mental health professionals and child survivors actually has to do with the German, well, in part, in part with the German restitution process. And I don't want to talk about it too much, it's a super long story, but basically the German restitution process, it opens in a, by a law, a federal law in 1956, West German, West German federal law. And sort of the late 50s and early 60s um, is a time when many child survivors are applying for restitution. And as I, as I noted before, those are some of the archival files I used were these restitution files. Um, and they are very, very interesting. And also I add, very underused documents. Um, so the federal, the West German agency that looked at the files uh, did not accept that you could have lasting psychological damage from the experience during the war. This was, I, I add, a commonly held psychiatric and psychoanalytical understanding at the time that trauma um, had immediate, you know, the kind of trauma had immediate consequences and but there was certainly no like lingering effects and no um, 
um, I'm trying to think of the word, it, like the, uh, the um, symptoms shouldn't pop up decades later. Okay, we now understand it's kind of central to the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorders that the, the symptoms can pop up decades later, but that wasn't understood or accepted at the time. So it was partly because child survivors were applying and then being continuously <laughs> rejected from this compensation that you ended up with sort of warring factions of uh, psychiatrists, uh, psychologists, and psychoanalysts, some saying, oh, no, no, there are no lasting consequences of trauma, and others saying, well, actually, we're starting to see signs that, that maybe, maybe there are. So it's, it's, it's a really vituperative debate, and it goes on for a long time. And I think the most interesting thing about it is that child survivors end up very much caught between the two extremes. In one sense, I think they are um, pleased to have some of their, you know, anxieties acknowledged and taken seriously. And goodness knows there's almost nothing more painful in that midlife or that kind of early adult moment for many of them than being rejected from the restitution scheme and being told you can't possibly be suffering ongoing psychological consequences. But they also weren't necessarily so sure about these sympathetic uh, mental health professionals who were kind of looking at them like they were looking for trauma. And I, if, Christine, do we have time? Can I read a really short quote from the book? Sure. Or shall I not? <laughs> then I will. Sure. Okay, so a lot of the uh, first oral history, like this early, was late 1970s, early 1980s oral history with child survivors is actually done by psychologists and psychoanalysts. So it's got a, a really, a very different tone, f maybe from the testimony we we're talking about that comes up later. Um, but child survivors weren't necessarily comfortable with psychologists sort of hunting around in their brains for, for trauma. So um, there's a really, really fabulous collection um, created by a psychologist and psychoanalyst named Judith Kestenberg. Uh, you can access the whole Kestenberg collection. Um, it's at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and it's full like audio files plus the transcripts. It's really, really fantastic. I think there's 1500 interviews with child survivors. And again, it's a very underused uh, resource. But Kestenberg was, uh, you know, psychoanalytically trained. And so she asked her questions, I suppose, with she's looking for trauma in the experiences of these um, grown up child survivors. And so here's an interview, August 1984, um, with a child survivor named R.G. Kestenberg says, do you have any aftermath of the Holocaust? Do you have any uh, anxieties or hangups that are connected with the Holocaust? And R.G. says, well, hangups, I don't know. We all have our hangups, right? Well, how did you feel during your pregnancies? Did you have good pregnancies? Yeah, no problems. Good deliveries? Oh, natural childbirth. Were you a very anxious mother? Uh, anxious? Well, I might have been a little overprotective with my first one. Do you sometimes go hungry without eating? No, no, I'm not obsessive about food at all. You're pretty orthodox, right? Well, if you ask an orthodox, I'm not orthodox. But if you ask a conservative, you are, right? Well, I have a kosher home and I enjoy my religion. I'd get terribly upset if my daughters came home with a non-Jew. As a matter of fact, I think I would be very, very, very upset. And I've told them from the day they were born and they tell me, yes, we'll open the oven. I say, that's right, the head goes right in there. And you can hear uh, Judith Kestenberg, the interviewer sort of going, she just doesn't get where this is going. Whose head goes in there? Mine, your head goes in there. That's right. When they bring a Gentile home, your head goes in the oven. Yes, and then the interviewee laughs. And she laughs in this way that, you know, she's trying to tell Judith Kestenberg, the joke's on you, because she knows exactly what this image of a survivor, you know, going into the oven means. And she's playing with a little bit because of course, you know, she's just the interviewee and here's the big famous expert and she doesn't want to openly challenge her, but she wants to prod her a little bit and say, you're, you're asking me these questions about trauma, but that's not, that doesn't, represent my experience. And I think there's a very delicate balance there between, you know, wanting your fears and anxieties to be acknowledged and not wanting your life to be pathologized. And I understand that impulse. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, should we hand over to 
yeah, if we could, if we could well, take some, now. yeah, some questions. Um, we had one that came in through email from Alan, and um, it's actually related to what you've just been talking about, the, but the longer term effects of trauma. And so he has asked if in relation to survivors of the Holocaust who went on to have children themselves, to what extent were those children affected firstly by what their parents went through, and secondly, by their own status as children of survivors? I am asked that question a lot. I know. <laughs> And I am, I am not an authority. Uh, I'm, well, I'm a different kind of authority, I suppose, because I am the child of an infant survivor of the Holocaust. And also, a, my grandmother was also a Holocaust survivor and my uncle is a Holocaust survivor. And, and so I, I reflect on my own life a little bit through, you know, that optic, I suppose. I think you can probably tell from what I read to you just now that I'm skeptical about the idea of inherited trauma, because I think it's overly simplistic. And I think that, uh, you know, as with many people, I don't want to see my experiences pathologized either. Have I inherited some of my mother's anxieties? Yeah, definitely. But we probably mostly have. Um, do I think I am a different person because of what my family went through? Yes, but many of those things are rather positive ways of looking at the world with a great deal of gratitude and, and valuing things uh, differently possibly and a lot of the child survivors i interviewed say that as well they say you know i'm i'm deeply deeply grateful for things like food you know when i eat food i really think wow i am lucky to have this food and and i am lucky to you know have this and that i mean the the, the idea of luck is something i also talk about in the book as a problematic concept but um i yes i think that it is inevitable that when your family has a great big hole in the middle of it, the hole of the loss of a big part of it, and not just of the people, but of the place and the community, then you, you kind of can't get away from the fact it will, that hole is going to be passed down the generations in, in some ways, in many ways. Um, but I don't know if I think those ways are necessarily all problematic or bad, or um, they simply are, well, for me, they just are what I am. <laughs> I can't imagine being another way. Um, I don't want to be another way. Um, yes, there are deep, deep sort of veins. And one day, one day, I would really like to write a book about that. Um, so we'll get there, maybe. Well, you've, an you've answered um, Robert Gilday's question about your next book, about the project on um, Anna Freud. So I'm just going to skip to Katie's question. Um, if you found that the countries that the child survivors were located in after the war had an impact on their stories or their outcomes, or is it more down to individuals themselves or their own circumstances? That is a great question. Um, because a short answer is maybe in the short term, yes, and in the longer term, no, if that makes sense. So. I think chiefly all the children in the book, the child survivors in the book, they all emigrated out of Europe, basically. So they emigrated chiefly to the US, Canada, Britain, and Australia, and a few, few other places. Um, and yes, of course, those nations did affect, I mean, what was going on in those countries affected their own thinking about their past because the Holocaust was more broadly being thought about in different ways in those countries, up to a point. I think there's a, a point at which the kind of story of a Holocaust survivor ends up having a lot of synergies kind of across those, those international boundaries. But of course it did make a difference. If you end up in a big you know, Jewish community in New York versus practically on your own in Winnipeg, it will necessarily make a difference to how you can talk about your story. If there's anyone around who can understand what you're saying, if you've got a friend who's been through something similar and, and that can make all the difference really. I mean, one of the things I was thinking about earlier was how um, we didn't have a chance to talk about it, but I, I do in the book try to look at how the lives of these child survivors sort of slot in with a developing Holocaust consciousness in Western countries. So it's happening in all these countries with a slightly different pace. And it sort of makes you then wonder, well, what if the wider world hadn't ever taken an interest in the Holocaust? As indeed is the case up until kind of the, the 1970s. These children are trying to learn about their past and they're doing it in almost complete isolation and there's no scholarly texts they can turn to, there's no access to the archives. 
you know, what if the, <laughs> what, what if the world hadn't become interested in the Holocaust? It's the fact that people are interested that, for example, um, makes oral historians go to their door and ask for their stories. What if nobody had asked for their stories? How would they then answer that question of, of who am I? And we would have a really, really different book and a very different experience. I don't have any doubt about that. I've got two more questions, which I think if we can hang on for an extra five minutes, we can um, get to if everyone's okay with that. Um, Valerie is asking, what the, and this is a pretty straightforward question, the age range in terms of birth dates of your subjects oh, and why. Yeah, I, yeah, great, thank you. Thank you, Valerie, for asking that because I never said and I need to explain. So um, the children in the book were all born between 1935 and 1945. 44, really. <laughs> There's a, one very, very, very infant um, survivor in the book. Um, I did that very deliberately because I wanted to get at that question of how, I don't know if we talked about this yet. The question that drove the whole book was this question of how you tell your life story when you don't know where you come from. And with older child survivors, they do know where they came from because they can remember life before the war. But for these very young ones, they might have no pre-war memory, they might have sort of fragmented pre-war memories, but they don't have something kind of solid and logical, I suppose, to draw on because that's the nature of, of children's memory. And that's why I really looked very exclusively at the very young child survivors because I just wanted to see what happens. Um, I mean, I have to admit, actually, I first started to wonder about this um, when I was working many years back now with Robert Gilday on a project on activists in Europe in 1968. And we went out and interviewed hundreds of people who were active in different social movements in and around, you know, in the 60s and in the 70s. And uh, I just, I collected such a volume of stories for that project. I started to think about how we tell our story. I thought about it a lot at the time. And we all pretty much tell our story the same way. If I go and interview all of you who are here tonight, or if you came and interviewed me, you probably find that, you know, with a microphone stuck in your face and someone telling you, tell your life story, you'd start with your parents or maybe even your grandparents, or you'd start with the town you were born or the community you came from that's where we root our stories. Like as human beings, that's what we do. And it was on the back of that kind of discovery, which is not really very profound, but I started to notice it when we were doing the, the 1968 project. I thought, well, what would happen if you couldn't start your story there? How do you tell your story? So that's why the emphasis on the very young, because that's the question I, I want to get at. And hopefully then in following, you know, through 75 years of their lives uh, in the book, I've shown that the answer to that question is very different at different points in the in the life cycle. Thank you for that. Um, so I think we have time for one last question. It's from Gabriel Finder, um, and he's he's written a lovely comment um, and thanking us for organizing. Um, and he said that he's found compelling your account of the emotional toll uh, that oral his oral testimony took and takes on children's child survivors. Um, and he's asking if any of the child survivors in your book ever gave testimony in a court of law in trials against perpetrators, and if so, did they describe the emotional toll that giving testimony in court took on them? That is a great question, Gabby, and the answer is no. <laughs> I mean, if, they, if any of them ever did, they never told me. Um, I can't think of any of the 100 who spoke of giving testimony in a court of law. I can only imagine that if they had been called upon to do so, they would have found it really, really challenging. I mean, one of the things that most amazed me about doing this was thinking about how these child survivors had to become historians of themselves. That's what they did. And sometimes they literally did it just the way a historian would do it. They went to the archives and they dug around and tried to find out who they were. I told you the story of, of Irwin B and I showed you his picture. Um, he, I spent years trying to find him. And basically by the time I found, I managed to trace him to this kibbutz where he lived most of his life in Israel, he had just died. But the um, archivist at the kibbutz shared his, um, his obituary with me. And that was such a fascinating document because his friends had said different things about him. And many of them had said he had a drawer in his home. And in this drawer 
or is this kind of pitiful little collection of documents he had about his early life. And that was his most precious possession. That was the story of, that's how he told who he was, because he had this little collection of paper documents. And I think also about um, one of the interviewers, I, uh, it's one of the interviewers, one of the survivors I interviewed very early on, how she told actually the, the story of how she had visited different archives to figure out who she was and how actually many of the archives weren't open because of course they were in Eastern Europe. So until the, the kind of, you know, until the end of the Cold War, basically she couldn't access them. And even for many years afterwards, uh, she, couldn't, she couldn't access them. And so that slow, slow, infuriating decades long process of trying to dig around in the archives to figure out who the hell you are, um, is it, it took, it took years and years and years. So I can only imagine if, if they had, if any of these child survivors had been called into a court of law, you know, in earlier decades, they might have had very little that they felt they could have said. Well, I think with that, Dan, did you have any closing remarks that you wanted to add? No, just that I'm extremely grateful to Rebecca for such a uh, thought-provoking uh, response to my questions. And again, to, to say it's really, it's a wonderful book. So I hope everyone will uh, enjoy reading it as much as I do. I'm sorry, I remembered one more thing I want to say. Can I yeah, interrupt? Feel free. Yeah. It's, about that, it's about that question of finding the documents who say who you are. Can I just say that I could not have done this research without the Wiener Library and also without incredible digitized collections like that of the International Tracing Service, for example, um, which I used at the Wiener Library. These things have only become accessible fairly recently. They are incredibly precious resources. Uh, Dan is an expert on the ITS archives, um, but I don't think enough historians are using them. Please get out there and use them. And for the, you know, for child survivors who so desperately wanted to learn about their pasts, I mean, what Christine knows that um, there's a child survivor, he's uh, someone I'm very close to, but he, I don't actually write about his story in this book because I'm writing about it in the next book. We managed in the ITS archives to basically discover so much incredible material about his life. Um, and that was in yeah, 2019. <laughs> and he didn't know a lot of this stuff and there was no way for him to know before. So it's, it's the 21st century, but a lot of this stuff is only becoming accessible now. These are stories that are, we can only piece together now. Um, and there's a lot of work still to be done. On that very um, uplifting note, <laughs> thank you, Rebecca, and thank you to everyone who has joined in tonight. Um, really pleased for all of your questions. And yes, please buy the book. It's, it's available at the link I sent, and also it'll be listed on our website from the event listing. So thank you, everyone, for joining in. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Dan, for leading a terrific discussion. And yes, see you all again at our next event. Thank you Thanks so again. much, everybody. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye.